Hi, good afternoon. This is Kristen Muscati. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the NCH Healthcare System. And today we have uh, two physicians here with us that I'd like to introduce to you to talk about heart health for the holidays. So again, happy holidays. Uh, it's, it's upon us. Hard to believe that actually next week and the next two weeks are already here. So I'd like to introduce um, uh, right here to my left, this is Dr. Samantha Sublett. She went to undergraduate at Purdue and was at Indiana University Medical School and did her med medicine residency at Emory. She then went to the University of Illinois, uh, Louisville for cardiology fellowship and back to Indiana for electrophysiology. So she's been with us here, here in Naples uh, at NCH uh, studying and taking care of cardiac electrophysiology for us. And then also on the line, we have Dr. Jordan Ray, who's from May, uh, Mayo Clinic, also a cardiologist, went to undergrad at Southwest Baptist University in Missouri, and then went to medical school at the University of Missouri, and then went up to Jacksonville, Florida for um, his uh, residency and also his um, fellowship in cardiovascular disease and is currently at the Mayo Clinic. So the way we'll work this today is first we'll have Dr. Ray walk through heart health for the holidays and some things we can do to, to help us during this time. And then we'll have Dr. Sublett give some additional information. We've had specific questions on how things like alcohol can affect our heart. And so we'll, we'll segue into that and then pause for questions after the two um, presentations. So with that, I would like to welcome you both. Thanks so much for joining us today. And, and Dr. Ray, if you'd, um, thanks. If you'd take it from here for us. All right, thank you very much for having me. Um, and I'd just like to say it's a it's an honor to get to talk about these kind of things with all of you today. The uh, what I was asked to do was to talk about holiday heart health. Um, I find it a little bit challenging to kind of beat people over the head about eating healthy and exercising. So, what I want to do is I want to talk about the five things uh, that I try to stress with all of my patients when they come into clinic and we talk about heart health. Uh, the most important thing is centralizing around what we consider preventable heart disease. Uh, and that most important preventable heart disease is what we call atherosclerosis. So this is cholesterol hardening of the arteries. There's a graphic representation of what happens over time. And this is the disease that leads primarily to heart attacks and strokes, the most common source of heart attacks and strokes. And it's a very important aspect of cardiovascular disease because this is preventable. Um, the other thing I want to kind of stress is atherosclerosis is very complex. I think a lot of us have in our minds this idea that it's just clogs in our arteries, this cholesterol, but in reality, it's a very complex interplay between cholesterol as well as our immune system and the blood vessel itself. It's more than just cholesterol in your artery. There's a ton of chemical signals that are involved that either increase or decrease this physiology. Uh, and so because this is complex, it becomes increasingly important that patients are aware of their risk factors because they all play a big role in restoring cardiovascular health. So my first okay. healthy tip I tell patients. I was, I was just going to, I want to make sure we can see your screen. Are you sharing um, your presentation screen so that everyone can see it? I am. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. I think if we reshare it, we just want to make sure our technology is keeping up with you. I think we're seeing it now. Yes, we have it now. So thank you. Well, Sorry to interrupt. We wanted to be sure that the community was seeing your slides. Okay, thank you. The uh, Sorry, I couldn't tell if I was or wasn't. It was highlighting the screen. So so here that here's that graphical representation of this kind of cholesterol building up over time uh, and ultimately leading, leading to a vascular event like a heart attack or stroke. Uh, and here's a very complex graphical representation of what that is. It's, it's cholesterol and a series of immune system cells uh, that are involved in creating this disease and perpetuating the disease. Uh, and this is what a kind of a complex plaque looks like in a, in a cartoon form. And so it's important to understand that it's more than just cholesterol. Uh, so my first heart healthy tip is it's much more than just telling yourself, I have good cholesterol or I have bad cholesterol. It's very important to know all of your risks because cardiovascular disease is incredibly personal. So what may be high risk for you might not be as high risk for the neighbor. Uh, and so you need to know all of your risks accordingly. Uh, and that's because it's more than just metabolism of cholesterol. There's an inflammatory component and there's a vascular health component. And so here are a list of the most common modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Highlighted in red are the ones we can't change. I can't stop getting older uh, and I can't change who my parents were. 
Uh, but what the, I can change are the things that are listed in blue here. Uh, and these are all very important. And the reason that these are all very important, particularly the modifiable risk factors, is because there are pretty sobering statistics about these risks. If you're over the age of 45 and you have one of those major risk factors, you have a five-fold increase of having a cardiovascular event before your life is over. If you have two, then you have a seven times increased risk for having cardiovascular disease. So these risk factors are very important to understand. And it's not enough just to focus on one. You really need to think about all of them. And then thinking about the fact that 80% of this type of cardiovascular disease is prevented with early lifestyle and diet changes. So whatever types of things that we need to do to modify our risk factors now, it's important to continue that. Uh, and I'll segue to my second heart healthy tip, which is everything that you eat matters. And so when I see patients in clinic, I hear a lot of these types of misconceptions. One is I can eat poorly on the weekend, but I'll make up for it the rest of the week. It's important to understand once you swallow, your body decides what to do with that food. And if it's not something good, you don't really get a whole lot of control over that. The other thing that I think a lot of us think about is that salads will unclog your arteries. Cholesterol that builds up is not going to go away and it usually stays there the rest of your life. And all of the risk factor modifications that you do, the goal is to try to stabilize and prevent further progression. And so as we think about holiday foods, one of the biggest important things I try to warn patients about is the hidden simple sugars. So these are classic things that we eat during this time and they are all loaded with way too much sugar. Anything with just simple starches like breads or pastas, it becomes just sugar once it gets into your system. So it's essentially no different than eating these things. Um, and so holiday desserts enough said, sugar is very inflammatory. Sugar accelerates cholesterol buildup in your arteries. And so it plays a very particular important uh, role in modifying your long-term risk factors. The other thing I tell patients is choosing your protein is, uh, wisely is very important. Uh, red meats may actually be inflaming. So it may not be just that it's fatty and cholesterol filled. It may be that it's accelerating the inflammation in these blood vessels as well. So I try to tell my patients that the farther away your food is from you genetically, the more healthy it should be. And so primarily focusing on eating fish is the most important thing that I can tell patients when it comes to a protein choice. Here are a list of heart healthy diets. These are the four most studied diets uh, in America um, and they all have very robust diet or uh, robust data to support their improvement in cardiovascular health. And I've kind of listed them in the order of most restrictive and least restrictive uh, based on what they allow you not to eat uh, for those of you who have uh, kind of particular concerns. And segue to the third heart healthy tip Exercise may not be what you think it is. Um, I see a lot of patients in clinic that are kind of filled with some misconceptions. Uh, the first and foremost is the common misconception about what exercise is. It's not staying active. It's not being out in the yard. It's not being busy around the house. All of those are things that are very good, but they're not necessarily exercise and they may not be necessarily benefiting you as much as true exercise would. It also doesn't have to be CrossFit, flipping tires, hitting things with sledgehammers. You don't have to be a marathon runner and you don't have to be running triathlons to create an exercise program for you that actually improves your cardiovascular health. So here's some tips about exercise that I want you to kind of focus on. You're really shooting for about 150 minutes per week. You don't wanna have an exercise routine that's less than 15 minutes at a time. You really wanna to try to create a routine that's lasting uh, it needs to be kind of repetitive and that long. And then the common thing I tell my patients when it comes to aerobic exercise is think about things where if you're walking or running or doing some type of aerobic training, you can talk in fragments, but you couldn't sing or whistle. That's the kind of threshold that you're looking for from an intensity standpoint. So if you're running and you could whistle or sing, then you're not exercising intensely enough. Um, and if you're walking and you can barely talk, then you might be exercising just a little bit too intensely. So you can vary some of the uh, types of exercise to fit this parameter. One of the common things I see is patients uh, can, can, they don't wanna run, but they like walking. And I tend to tell them to incorporate some type of hand weight into their exercise. And I've done this before, it is actually pretty intense. Uh, you can certainly meet this intensity just by using hand weights. Transitioning to heart healthy tip number four, you can't substitute one form of prevention for another. This is a very common thing I see in clinic. I think I am guilty of this. Uh, it's important to focus on exercise isn't everything. 
if you are a marathon runner, you can't just eat whatever you want. Um, these two things work in different ways in preventing cardiovascular disease. So if you're not focusing on both pathways of prevention, you may not be benefiting yourself as much as you think. Likewise, diet's not everything. So if you're a strict vegetarian, but you're also a couch potato, you're probably not helping yourself to a great degree from a cardiovascular standpoint, because both of these play a very major role in prevention. And so that leads to the last heart healthy tip. I think the most important of all the heart healthy tips, and that is cardiovascular prevention is a lot like a callus. Uh, when you think about callus formations, a good callus is only present, or a good callus is present when you use it. Uh, if you stop using your hands a whole lot, you'll lose your calluses and you start forming blisters. And so one of the common things I see in clinic is patients will say, oh, when I was younger, I was really active, or I was an athlete when I was in college. You can't coast on your past. So it's very important to focus on the fact that if you're not active now, you're at particular risk. If you're not eating right now, but you used to, you're still at particular risk. And so it's important to understand that like a good callus, it should only be there when you use it and you can lose it if you stop using it as much. So I'll conclude with a couple of big important points. One, it's extremely important to understand your cardiovascular risks and know that it's very personal. So risks for one person may not be necessarily the same risk for others, but all risk factors are important. Uh, it's a purposeful prevention. It's a combination of diet, exercise, and other risk factor modifications. And you can't just do one. You really have to focus on all of them. And it's only going to give you benefit as long as you're participating and taking these types of things very seriously. So with that, I think I'll transition to our next speaker to talk a little bit about some of the other important aspects of our diet during holiday health. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ray. We really appreciate it. I can tell you that I think particularly number four resonates with me as well in terms of you can't exchange one for the other. So you really need to do both the exercise and, and the diet. I think that's a great fact for all of us. And, and I know I have personally taken it to heart and, and instituted a more rigorous walking program. So really appreciate your help with that. But now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sublett to give us a little bit more information on what we can control for our heart health over the holidays. Thank you, Dr. Mascotti. All right, so some of the questions that I hear frequently have to do with alcohol. What kind of alcohol is quote unquote good for your heart uh, and how much, et cetera. And since uh, most of us tend to imbibe a little bit more around the holidays, I thought now would be a good time to, to discuss it. So light to moderate alcohol intake actually may lower the risk of coronary artery disease and uh, just your risk of death in general. But this is kind of what, this is a very delicate balance because excessive alcohol intake, uh, even if it's just sometimes, for example, binge drinking at a party, and we'll talk about that definition later, is actually toxic to your heart. It increases the risk of stroke, heart attack, atrial fibrillation, and even some types of cancer. So the relationship between alcohol and the heart is something that we call a J-shaped curve, meaning that a little bit will reduce the risk of certain diseases. But if you go past that point, you actually begin to increase the risk of the same, those exact same diseases. The key is what we call light to moderate drinking. It's actually associated with a reduction in total mortality of 18%. And in several studies, it has been associated with a reduction in cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke by 30 to 35%. So what is? What is light to moderate consumption? Well, it actually depends on your gender. For men, up to two standard drinks per day is considered moderate. For women, up to one standard drink per day. And what is the standard alcoholic drink? That would be about 12 ounces of regular beer, which is usually around 5% alcohol, five ounces of wine, which is typically about 12% alcohol, or one and a half ounces of spirits or liquor, which is usually about 40% alcohol, and that's 80 proof. As you can see, the lady in the picture is, uh, is having one drink, but is much more than a standard drink. So why? Why do we think that uh, 
that uh, why is a little alcohol good, but a lot of alcohol bad? It has to do with the way that the body processes alcohol. You will uh, break down alcohol into something called acetaldehyde, which is actually toxic. And you can only break that chemical down so quickly. So when you overwhelm your liver with, uh, with either the uh, speed at which you're drinking alcohol or the amount of alcohol that you drink in a given time, days or, or uh, weeks even, you can build up acetaldehyde. And that is, uh, that's why this ends up being a balance instead of just a linear relationship. It's why we have that J-shaped curve. And here is a bit of an explanation or an example of why men and women were not created equal when it comes to alcohol metabolism. Women have less body water than men, pound for pound, even if you're in great shape. So there is less volume for the alcohol to distribute itself in your body. That means that for any given amount of alcohol a, man, a woman consumes, she'll have a higher concentration in her body than a man. Women have less uh, of an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that breaks down alcohol than men. In fact, men have it in their stomach and largely in their liver, whereas women have almost none in their stomach and it's concentrated mostly in our liver. What that ends up resulting in is, let's say you're at a party, let's say that uh, a man and a woman, again, the exact same age, the exact same weight, drink three alcoholic beverages uh, within a span of about two hours. The man's blood alcohol concentration would be well below the legal limit but a woman of the same age and size, you're, she's clearly over the legal limit. So what about the good part? Well, alcohol will raise your good cholesterol, although interestingly enough, that's actually probably not the mechanism of risk reduction. Some good studies out of Russia have shown that they have ridiculously high good cholesterol, but, uh, but uh, that is not necessarily protective for them. It improves your insulin sensitivity. So even though it's not directly related to the heart, about one alcoholic beverage per day actually can uh, help you process sugar better. It also decreases markers of inflammation. And uh, Dr. Ray had already mentioned that inflammation does pay, play a role in coronary artery disease. Um, so here we have that J-shaped curve again on the graph to the left showing the, the risk of stroke. And you can see that really it's at one to two drinks per day, and that's for men and women, that your risk goes down. And beyond that, it starts to come back up again. When you're at five drinks, six drinks per day, you're actually increasing your risk. A, um, a surrogate for coronary artery disease is your coronary artery calcium score. And we see that same sort of J-shaped relationship right there. It's uh, one or two drinks per day seems to be helpful. And uh, more than that is associated with much worse outcomes. Another question that I'm often asked is whether the type of alcohol matters. Red wine does have higher levels of bioflavonoids than white wine or other forms of alcohol. And bioflavonoids have antioxidant, antiplatelets, and anti-endothelial effects, all of which are considered uh, helpful in reducing the risk of coronary or, uh, or stroke events. Having said that, most studies suggest that the specific type of alcoholic beverage is actually less important than the amount that you drink and the pattern in which you drink it. So uh, even though red wine does have special properties, uh, if, if it's not your favorite drink, you don't have to worry about that. So more than one to two drinks per day, and uh, this is averaged over a week, actually increases the risk of death, heart attack, stroke, cancer, especially breast cancer, ladies, um, accidental death, and abdominal obesity, which is another factor in your heart health. Even occasional excessive drinking presents health risks. Not just showing again, we're on that side of the curves. So how much is too much? Well, binge drinking, again, it depends on your gender. For women, it's considered four or more drinks on one occasion or within about two to three hours. 
And I like to bring that up around the holidays because that's easily achievable in a holiday, during a holiday party. For men, it would be five or more drinks on one occasion, again, within a two to three hour time span. Uh, heavy drinking for women is considered eight or more drinks per week. And heavy drinking for men is considered 15 or more drinks per week. And uh, I am a heart rhythm specialist and I had to mention a phenomenon called holiday heart. It is an arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, that is specifically triggered when someone has increased alcohol intake over their baseline. It is often when they are either on vacation or during the holidays. They drink a little bit too much and as we mentioned, alcohol has toxic effects on the heart and it can trigger atrial fibrillation, which in turn increases your risk of stroke. Okay, so little alcohol can be a good thing, but please just remember over the holidays that moderation is key. God, and that's so helpful. You know, I had not really heard of the holiday heart more of a syndrome, and that must be because you're just not used to the baseline, then you increase it, yes. and then you have some, some ill effects. So that's very, very helpful. Um, I, I appreciate both of you. I, I've definitely learned something and, and need to be mindful in the next coming few weeks in terms of both uh, diet and exercise as well as alcohol consumption. So I, I appreciate all the graphs that you had as well as helping us define when just enough helps, but then when is too much. So I think at this point, we'd be happy to take some questions and we'd open it up to the team. I think we have a few questions for us. Yeah, and if anyone else would like to submit questions, please do so in the question and answer button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So the first question is for Dr. Ray. Can you suggest healthy snacks that would be good for the family during the holidays? Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, my so a couple of good things that I like that my wife makes are anything with smoked salmon in it. So she has like these little crostinis with smoked salmon on them that are incredibly healthy. Uh, and then vegetables and hummus. And so hummus, all the chickpeas, a great source of protein, uh, but it's also incredibly heart healthy because it's almost always made with olive oil and some other very heart healthy fats. Um, and then I would say, oddly enough, we very much love eating guacamole during Christmas time. And so avocados are very much loaded in a lot of vitamins and heart healthy fats as well. Uh, and we put a lot of vegetables in it too, uh, like cucumbers and tomatoes and a couple other fresh veggies. Uh, so in our house, that's kind of what we eat from a snack standpoint as we're kind of watching football or playing football outside. Uh, that is a lot more heart healthy than like the traditional baked cookies. Right, and maybe that helps during when you're hanging out with family or friends to be able to choose some of those things or bring yeah. them or as much as we're able to somewhat socialize before um, eat during the holidays. So our next question is for Dr. Sublett. Would you suggest substituting alcohol with juices or sparkling cider over the holidays, or are you just trading one for another at that point? Uh, I probably would not because uh, juices and ciders tend to be high in sugar. Um, on the other hand, I, I do want to make clear that if you do not normally drink alcohol, I wouldn't recommend starting just for the sake of your heart health. The things that Dr. Ray spoke about with exercise and, uh, and eating a proper diet are much more worth it and you don't have to worry about that little, that balance. And we also have another question for you around alcohol. So as you know, spike seltzers and spike ciders are very popular these days. Should someone drink those over beer and wine for the holidays? Or is again, are you trading one off for another? It is kind of a one off for another. Uh, I would pay attention to the alcohol content to try to make sure that again, if, um, if it's about 5% alcohol, really about five ounces is, uh, is considered one drink. Um, and I think that's acceptable. I think probably some of them are lower in calories and might have less of a sugar content, but uh, I'm not, a, uh, most of the studies have, uh, that do compare types of alcohol have shown that they're fairly equivalent. As I said, even with the, even with the additional bioflavonoids of red wine, if we're looking at uh, heart attack and stroke risk reduction, alcohol tends to be fairly similar across the board. So this next question is for both doctors. So Dr. Ray, we'll let you <laughs> open it up first and Dr. Sublet, you can follow up with any comments. So as you know, the holidays can be stressful. People are wondering, in your experience, have you seen stress-related cardiovascular issues due to the holidays? 
And again, Dr. Ray, we can start with you. Oh, absolutely. Um, no question, stress is a, a major uh, focus on reducing cardiovascular risks, uh, primarily for a couple of different reasons. Uh, stress leads to poor sleep, um, and poor sleep leads to a lot of hormone secretions, particularly things like epinephrine, uh, which is adrenaline and noradrenaline, to kind of keep you awake because you didn't sleep well the night before. Uh, those have been associated with really bad uh, artery uh, inflammation and other disease points. Uh, and then chronic stress also leads to uh, a lot of cortisol or steroid production in your body, similarly because you're trying to stay awake and kind of cope uh, with some of the stress. Uh, and that is associated with a lot of insulin metabolism changes. It increases weight um, and it increases blood sugar. Uh, and as we've talked about, blood sugar is a really, really important thing with vascular health. It, it makes blood vessels stiffer uh, and it makes them more inflamed. And so I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Ray said. I think the holidays can be stressful for people. Um, possibly more so because of, uh, of the pandemic and having to try to figure out what you, you want to do. But I think that it's really worth it to <clears throat> take some time for yourself and try to de-stress and maybe go for a walk. Great. So our next question, Dr. Ray, is for you. It's related um, to exercise for the holidays. So as you know, with COVID, people aren't able to go to the gym as much or go outside into group activities. Is there any exercises you can suggest at home that would be beneficial to do during the holidays and that keeps one socially distanced? Uh, I mean, we all live in Florida, so it's hard, especially this time of year, to not give an excuse to go outside. Um, it's a little easier in the summertime, but I mean, this time of year, it was, I don't know. I also trained in Minnesota, and so uh, my wife says it's not cold enough here. Uh, and so we have very little excuse to... Uh, uh, to not go outside. So uh, a good brisk walk, I think, is a, an intense level of activity for most people who are not already kind of participating in exercise activities. Um, the other thing I try to stress with patients is holidays are kind of filled with watching TV uh, with um, a lot of the temptation with recorded TV shows. My wife and I are addicted to kind of the uh, holiday movies from Hallmark. And so we purposely do not fast forward through the commercials. We use the commercial breaks as kind of little exercise breaks. Um, and so we'll do uh, particular forms of like squats or other types of resistance or, or calisthenic like exercises uh, between uh, breaks. Uh, same thing we do whenever we're watching football, we use any of the commercial breaks as an excuse to kind of get up and stay active. It's a great reminder. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I think there's few excuses not to get out and be brisk. Uh, the important thing is it should be purposeful and scheduled too. So you should take time out of your day to say every day or most days of the week for 15 minutes, I'm going to do something repetitive. Um, and that's for most patients, you can find that kind of time. Um, and so you don't have to buy a, a types of uh, equipment or things like that necessarily. Uh, brisk walks are good. Um, climbing flights of stairs up and down is another thing you can do in your house as long as you're comfortable and safe doing that. I would like to add to that the, the part about your exercise being purposeful, even if it's only 15 or 10 minutes a day. Something as important as your cardiovascular health deserves 15 to 30 minutes of your time per day. You wouldn't think of telling yourself, oh, I was just too busy to brush my teeth today. It's something that we do as part of taking care of ourselves. And yet um, cardiovascular health is, uh, is just crucial, but people will often say, oh, I'm too busy or I didn't have time for it. That to me, that's, uh, that's, very, uh, that's not giving it the priority it deserves. I, I, I think it's that risk of sedentary lifestyle and how do you make sure you're purposeful and you sustain. That's where that sort of persistence come in and that's hard, but that's where I find myself personally needing to make sure you make the time and, and, and dedicate that to, to your health because the exercise component has to do with so many other things right. besides cardiovascular stroke, cancer mitigation, all of the above and just an overall healthy lifestyle. So I think that can't be reiterated or, or emphasized enough. Yeah. So our next question is a viewer who's looking into next year and creating resolutions as they go into the new year to improve their cardiovascular health. So they want to know from both doctors, if there's one thing you can't stress enough into practicing healthy heart, what would it be for 2021? And Dr. Selva, we can start with you. Uh, it, it is a tie between diet and exercise uh, to try to eat healthier. 
even ask your doctor for a new, if you're not sure about what is healthy in the Mediterranean diet, low carb, keto, all of these different things. Um, but maybe speak speak to a nutrition specialist to try to to get you uh, get you started and get you moving in the right direction. Um, so yeah, the diet and the exercise that we said, I think that it's uh, crucial to maintain your health. I really like the callus analogy as well. Is that you know something? If you ran track in high school and uh, you know that was 25 years ago, you're no longer getting benefit, at least from a cardiovascular standpoint, from atherosclerosis standpoint, from those uh, all those laps. So, go ahead, Dr. Ray. No, I, I mean, I, I, I think I can't stress either of those things enough. I, it's important to understand that uh, if you're not going to focus on making small, meaningful changes, then things become a whole lot harder and less sustainable. Uh, that's one of the reasons fad diets, they're very good at making a weight loss a possibility, but they are almost unsustainable long term. And so that's why the data kind of supports that fad diets almost always have patients regain the weight that they've lost. And so it is much more beneficial for you to be purposeful uh, and make small changes that are meaningful. So that way, in let's say six months from now, you reflect and go, oh, I've made a bigger difference in my cardiovascular health rather than on January 1st, you're going to start running and training for a marathon, you're only going to eat cucumbers, and you're only going to drink water. Uh, almost always that's unsustainable, and you'll just go back to your old habits to begin with. I, agree. I, I think the biggest lesson that I heard from our, our two experts today was it really is an and, not an or. You yes. have to do the exercise and the diet, and even though it's painful for us to hear, I think it's that and, not or. That's yeah. so important. Agree. And don't be discouraged if you, you know, I think uh, if, if you forget to exercise one day, that's all right, but keep doing it. Keep at it. Well, that's all the questions we have for today. So I'm going to leave it for closing remarks from our panelists and our hosts. Sure. Great. I, I would just like to thank both of you today. I, I learned a lot. I, there's a lot of science behind it as well as what can we do. And I really loved the way we looked at what we could control. There are factors we can't control with our health, but there's much we can control. And it really is that balance. So I would like to thank both of you so much. We appreciate the affiliation with Mayo Clinic that NCH has and wish everyone a very healthy and, and happy holidays. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.